Hi everyone, this is one of my quick tip videos. Lindsay the Frugal Crafter asked me this morning if there is an easy way, as she put it, for mere mortals to know if paint contains a mineral or a dye and whether it would be staining or not, or granulating or not. I am actually doing a longer video in my colour chemistry series, which you'll see coming up in maybe a week or two on staining and how it works, why certain dyes stain and how you can predict how much they will stain based on looking at them and also minerals and granulation and what granulation is, how to encourage it, how to discourage it, all those kinds of things. So this is just kind of a quick, quick tip. If you look on any paint, you'll see a colour index number. There's often two. One of them begins with CI and it's just a string of digits. The other one, which is actually more useful to us as artists, is the one that's kind of like PV15 or um, PB5 or PR101, those numbers. Those numbers are part of the colour index. So the colour index is an international index of dyes, pigments and, and everything else. And Within that index, the point of those numbers is to make it universal so that someone in a country where they use a different alphabet, like um, let's say someone living in a country where Arabic is the standard language, can still identify what the paint is, even if it's called something that looks nothing like what it would look like in uh, English. So it's kind of like the periodic table, symbols of the periodic table. So just to um, tell you how that works. I mean, you can subscribe to the Colour Index and you can actually get access to it. And I'm going to put some elements of the Colour Index. Someone has transcribed a version of it, it's an old version, onto the web. And I'll link that in the description so you can use it. Many companies, if you go on their website, will translate what the codes mean, what the name of the dye is. So all dyes and all pigments have a name. So Pigment Red 101, for example, is an iron oxide. Pigment Blue 15 is thalocyanine blue. Those names are how you know whether something is ultimately a mineral or a dye. There are a few exceptions, but the very, very basic rules are as follows. If the name has got words like oxide, hydroxide, hydrated, um, silicate, I think that is pretty much the main ones. I'm just going through my own paints, just trying to see um, if there are any that I've missed out. Oh, phosphate. That's another common one. Um, oh, um, cobalt nitrite. There's two of those that exist. Those are really all the main ones, and the other one that fits in this group is Prussian blue, which is ferric ferrocyanide, but it's not always written as that. Sometimes they just list it as Prussian blue. All of those ones, and anything that's got sulphide, selenide, sulfoselenide, all of those are likely to be mineral. So they're fairly likely to have some degree of granulation. You know, even CAD red has got some granulation. Not as much as ultramarine blue, nowhere near as much as Potter's Pink. Now, my forthcoming video on dyes and staining and everything else and granulation will explain the whys and wherefores of all of that, but that was just to tell you the basics. Anything else, so things with long, organic-y looking names, and by that I mean things that have got azo, diazo, so D-I-A-Z-O, um, phthalo, P-H-T-H-A-L-O, um, quinacridone, acridone in any form that you may see it in, um, pretty much all the ones you're going to come across will have some variation of that, or names like Hansa Yellow, Bismarck Brown, Congo Red, all those kinds of names, they're going to be dyes. So that's just a rough way to know off the top of your head. If you just know the name of the pigment, 
to tell you whether it'll be a mineral or whether it'll be a dye. And that's in absolute layman's terms. I can't really make it any more simple than that with it still making a fair amount of sense. But I'll give you a, a quick tip from my staining and granulating video that is forthcoming so that you can have it for free right now. Dyes that stain, there's a really simple rule you can follow and it's really easy. All you need is part of the alphabet. PQRS, okay? Thalocyanine, quinacridone, red, staining. What I mean by that is thalocyanines, quinacridones and most reds will stain to some degree. They're some of the most staining pigments that are out there. The thalocyanine group, so that's thalo green, thalo turquoise, thalo blue, and all of those have got variations. There's about 10 dyes called thalo blue. You'll only see two of them commonly used in paints, the green shade and the red shade, but there are others. Okay, there's a whole family of them. The quinacridones include quinacridone burnt scarlet, quinacridone gold, even though that's often um, a fake mixture or a hue these days. Um, quinacridone magenta, quinacridone rose, quinacridone red, all of that family. They're all very strongly staining. And you'll also get it from the um, reds. A lot of the reds do stain. So the dye-based reds, that is. So things like uh, rhodamines, um, alizarins, all of those kinds of things have got some degree of staining to them. I mean, it's not universal, pyrrole red. They all stain to some level, some more than others. It's not universal, not every red or get, not every red dye stains, but a lot of them do. The reason why these things stain, and I can say fairly universally that the thalocyanine group all stain, is because what staining actually is, is about the paint, well, the dye molecule, sorry, having a particular functional group, so a, 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 a sticky region, if you like, in the molecule that has a very strong affinity for cellulose, which is basically what watercolour paper is always made of. So I know that thalocyanines all possess this, and that means they will stain really strongly. And what makes thalocyanines stain really, really strongly is that they can also bind to proteins, and the majority of sizes that are used are protein-based or amino acid-based to some degree. So they won't just stick to the paper, they will stick to the size as well. They'll have stronger affinity for one than the other, which is why on heavily sized papers like Milford, you can still wash them off of the size. But if they did get through to the paper, it's much harder to get rid of them. So that's just a quick kind of overview. Um, I've done it in under 10 minutes to just explain to you how you can get a rough idea. The other way to kind of get an idea is to actually look... Um, to actually look at them, and really annoyingly, the uh, the rack of um, or the or the palette, I should say, that I wanted to show you is is typically the bottom one of all my palettes that are in use at the moment. If you put a paint out and dry it down, which many of us do, and you just have a look at it, your dye-based paints have a tendency to look after they've dried down, kind of plasticky kind of hard like this Windsor Red Deep which is a pyrrole red. Your minerals can look very very variable so this Cad Scarlet which is a mineral. This one has got a bit of separated binder which is why it's glossy but it would like if you look up here it's reasonably matte. If you look at things like this Venetian Red it's almost chalky. It's very clay like because that's what it is. It's made of a type of clay effectively. Iron oxide is the stuff that makes clay that colour that clay is. So that's why it resembles it to our eyes. Anything like that is a mineral. That's a way to tell. Let's just have a look on the other side. That gold ochre again has got binder separation, so that's hard to tell. Naples yellow is a mineral. Um, it's again hard to tell. These are really shiny because I've dried them recently. This cad lemon, you can see again, has got that slight chalky finish because it's mineral. Whereas this Lemon Yellow Deep, which is dye, very, very, very different. Windsor Yellow Deep has got that plasticky sheen to it. That's what you often get with the dyes when you're 
kind of looking at them. That phthalo turquoise has got it as well. That sort of plasticky consistency. Whereas others, like this Davis Grey, which is a mixture of minerals, has got that kind of chalky finish. So that's another way you can kind of get an idea. Uh, the reality is the more you paint with things, the more you get used to things. Which is why as you get more experienced, as soon as you see a half pan, even though you haven't painted it out, you know what it is. Because you know what the consistency and the colour are like. And it's not just about knowing what colour they are when they're dried down. It is about knowing the consistency as well, because cadmium pigments can look the same as Scarlet Lake, but the consistency, it's not the colour is the same, the consistency is really different. So there's my little quick tip for you, but there will be a really, really detailed video coming up, which will give you some chemistry, because it's part of the colour chemistry series, to help you understand why some things stain more than others and how we can actually predict that. Just to show you before I go, from my Spin Doctor Sits, um, kind of, it's almost, a, uh, it's kind of equivalent of a stitch and bitch, but on my own, it, it's a make and bitch, really. I wind while I make things. I finished my little watercolour blocks. They're brilliant. They've held together really well. That's my big one that I did with the really good quality paper. And the crap one that I did with the not quite so good quality with postcards. And I decorated the back with the um, Tim Holtz... Um, Crowded Attic, I think that's the name, sticker series, but I, I just can't find anything to do with these stickers, so I figured that was as good a use for them as any, um, to use them to decorate these little blocks. So, if you want to know how to make those, check Lindsay the Frugal Crafter's channel out, because all I was doing was seeing how easy or hard they are to make. They are really easy, anyone could make those, if they can use one of these things and have got a little bit of patience. I mean, it really took me 20 minutes to make these, and they're brilliant. I think they're going to be great to paint with um, in what's left of the summer. So thank you all very much, and goodie, and goodie.